and ever. Amen. John 16, verse 1. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, this, the time is coming when, you, when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or, or me. I have told you this so that when, the, when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I do not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you but now I am going to him who sent me none of you ask me where are you going rather you are filled with grief because I have said these things but very truly I tell you it is for your good that I am going away unless I go away the advocate will not come to you but if I go I will send him to you when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear but when he the spirit of truth comes he will guide you into all the truth he will not speak on his own he will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive that what will make him known to you all that belongs to the father is mine that is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Thanks, Roscoe, for that Bible reading. I, I now um, invite Bert to come forward and he's going to lead us in talking about this passage of Scripture with the title, Now That Jesus Is In Heaven. So thanks very much, Bert. It's a privilege to be with you today. Lovely day, beautiful sunshine, crisp morning. good to gather around God's word and to be impacted again and I guess this is a, a passage of the Bible that um, I've read many times and it's spoken to me freshly again um, recently. Let me begin with a, a word that's a word we probably don't use much and our young people may not even know what it means. Um, so the word is consternation, consternation, a very strong word. So I looked it up in some dictionary definitions, consternation. It speaks about a fear that makes you helpless, a disabling kind of fear. Another definition has it, a feeling of anxiety or dismay, typically at something unexpected, anxiety. And another definition, a sudden alarming amazement of dread or dread that results in confusion. So there's that disabling, uh, confusing, stifling result. Uh, in December 2016, 
uh, our son Matt, who was 23, uh, 33, was diagnosed with aggressive bowel cancer. And my wife Ria and I experienced consternation the day when the specialist said those words and came up with that diagnosis. Consternation. In our text today, Jesus makes a statement after teaching his disciples so long and teaching them about the Holy Spirit who would come and saying that the Holy Spirit would, would tell them about him. And that's how chapter 15 closes off. And it's said, well, you must testify about me. And then chapter 16 starts off with a lot of troubling things for the disciples. Um, look, I want to warn you. You'll be rejected from the synagogues. So that's like the church is going to push you out and the church is going to uh, reject you. You'll be persecuted even to death. That's what I want to warn you about, said Jesus. I've told you this before it happens. And, and I guess that would have been anxiety-inducing, those statements of Jesus. People who kill you will think they're offering a service to God. Wow, that's a, a horrible future to think about. Then comes a statement of Jesus and he says, I am going to him who sent me. I'm going. Okay, so here is Jesus. He's saying, I've given you a job. Testify about me. And it's going to be trouble and it's going to be hardship. You're going to be kicked out. You're going to be persecuted. And people will think they're doing God a favour by getting rid of you on the face of the earth. And then says Jesus, now I'm going to him who sent me. I think um, we can interpret that moment as consternation. And maybe the Bible, of course, doesn't have pauses. Maybe there was a long pause after Jesus said that because Jesus then makes the comment, well, how come no one's asking me? Where are you going? How come you're just sitting there? Probably because of that word that I used before. The ramifications of what Jesus said was sinking in, but then he said, I'm going. I'm leaving you. Why isn't anyone asking me now, where are you going? So here's this fear that kind of makes you helpless. This anxiety that stresses you and, and makes you unable to think anymore about what might happen and the result of that. Jesus was back from the dead, or would come back from the dead. He told them about testifying. He told them about the gift of the Holy Spirit. He told them about, about persecution. And then he said, I'm going. And they've got nothing to say. But Jesus does say to them, why are you filled with grief? Well, who can blame them? They've been with Jesus. They were not okay. There was heaviness, a hard sorrow. They were really distressed for three years with Jesus, constantly. He was always there, showing his power, 
showing his wisdom, explaining his work, his mission. And no one was thinking happy thoughts at this time. Then Jesus declares, it's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counsellor will not come to you. But if I go, I'll send him to you. So what Jesus is saying now is the very thing that these disciples need to hear in this state of mind. This is what's going to help them through. This is what's going to help them deal with their consternation. The stunning announcement, I'm going, should have been met with joy and gladness and belief and strength because it announced that that Jesus' work on this earth was finished. It's complete. Nothing more for him to do. And so Jesus takes this moment of anxiety to show that and to teach the disciples how they're going to live their lives. He gives them a new conviction. He gives them a cure for their anxiety and distress and trouble. And he says three things. Well, that's the three points of of the sermon today. And I guess when we think about these three things that Jesus says to his disciples when, when he announces that he's going, are three things that he meant for us too. They're recorded in scripture that we might be strengthened by them, that we might have power, that we might have steel in our veins as we go through life. All that I've been doing, says Jesus, showing the way back to the Father. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing on a global scale. Number one, he says, sin. That's what the Holy Spirit is going to be doing. He's going to give a heart change about that subject, sin. Righteousness. That's what the Holy Spirit's going to be doing. He'll make a person see that the only perfect Son of God will be able to restore us into right relationship again. And number three, there is a day of judgment. And the Holy Spirit is convicting the world to see that. His doom is sure and certain. Evil will not triumph. So those are the three points. And I want to ask you to think with me about those points that Jesus makes. A miracle needs to happen. That's the first thing. The Holy Spirit needs to come into every single person and enable them to see something that they can't see anymore because they're sinners, because they're born in sin. And they add to that every day. They cannot see that sin estranges them from God. They cannot see unless the Spirit of God makes them to see. There must be a miracle. He will convict the world of sin and guilt. How did you come to be a Christian? I guess for everyone there's a there's a different path. And for me and for you. But only when the Holy Spirit enables you to see what you have done and what I have done has offended a holy God and that's the cause of our separation from God. My willful blindness 
made me to be in that condition. I'm not a victim. I'm guilty. And that's the first miracle, that I've got to see my problem. And the problem is my guilt before a holy God. I've darkened my own heart. And how can you see that when you're living in darkness? No one will see that. And Jesus says the Holy Spirit is coming to convict the world of sin. That's the first miracle. Holy Spirit, fall on us, we prayed and sang. Take away my rebellion. Take away my blindness. Maybe not everyone here has yet seen this truth. But the Holy Spirit has opened your eyes to enable that. That's the miracle that's got to happen to me. That's the miracle that's also got to happen here on the North Coast, where I live in Launceston, in every country of the world. It's not a message that's going to go down well, is it? But everyone has to have that miracle. Doesn't mean we're going to go around yelling at people and saying, you go, you're going to hell. Because Peter reminds us, he called us out of darkness into his marvellous light. And when we can see who we are and what we've done, then the second miracle comes. The second miracle. But we see the great gulf between us. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And sin is that gulf. And secondly, the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to see the way to the Father and to the cross. And that goes, and that's how we come back to the Father. By Jesus taking that sin upon himself. By Jesus bearing the punishment, the curse. By Jesus taking away the cause of our separation. And giving us his righteous life. And so we read there in verse 9 and 10. He'll prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About righteousness... Because I'm going to the Father. Well, Jesus is going to the Father, the righteous one. And he's there before the Father now, the righteous one. And he takes with us, with him I should say, us, who he's washed clean by his blood and presents as righteous because he's filled us with his righteousness. There's the second miracle. First we've seen the, the nature of sin and our guilt. And then the convicting work of the Holy Spirit makes us to see that the only way back is sinless and holy through Christ, through his righteousness. When Jesus leaves, where does he go? He goes to the Father. And the miracle of the Holy Spirit opens our eyes that we accept him and receive him and walk with him. Has that miracle happened to you? That as well as seeing your guilt and your sin, and me too, that we also see 
that a miracle has happened and Christ has given us his perfect life. How good is that? That Jesus is not with us right now. He's with the Father right now. Pleading our cause on the basis of his perfect life. So, cleansed sinners, saved by grace. The old, old story. There's a something that John talked about, about uh, the senses and people being um, less and less inclined to write Christian on the census form. And I guess, well, it's still about 40%, I think, something like that. Um, but how much of that is religion? Even the ones who put down historically that they're Christian. How many of that 40% will say, I'm a Christian because I'm a wretched sinner. I was blind and now I see. And I see the risen Son of God at the right hand of the Father. And he's pleading for me. And he tells the Father there is no sin that can be ascribed to Bert because they're all washed away. My righteousness has been given to him. This world is wrong about sin. This world is wrong about Jesus and his righteousness. Yes, this world has a lot to say about religion. But it doesn't say why Jesus has gone to the Father. And only the Holy Spirit can do that miracle. There's one more thing that the Holy Spirit does. One more miracle that he convicts the world of. One more consternation busting truth. Remember consternation, that, that disabling anxiety and fear. One thing that we can know for sure, the, the Holy Spirit is proving the world wrong about the day of judgment. That Jesus will return. And if ever we need to know that, we need to know that now. He has been condemned. He has been defeated and yet he has great sway, doesn't he, in the world. I don't know if we're going to sing Martin Luther's hymn afterwards. Uh, a mighty fortress? Yep, okay. Well, we'll sing those words that Martin Luther ins were is inspired to write. Lo, his doom is sure. The prince of darkness... I told you I was suffering consternation when we heard the news about our, our son's a very strong cancer that invaded his body. The gospel promise is that all who are in Christ have been raised with him to life eternal. That's a matter of great comfort. And what Jesus is saying to his disciples now, his leaving will be a great source of comfort. As you realise more and more, judgment day is coming. And it's the hope of every believer. And I hope it's your hope in this crazy world. I don't know why this year seems to be crazier than any other year. Political forces at work, threats to world security. What distressing things are happening. 
pandemic, sickness. We read about insecurity, uh, instability in the Pacific with regard to China and things like that, the Ukraine. Where are things going? Changing of the law in Tasmania with regard to what can be taught about gender. Justice. Even rallies in Hobart yesterday about abortion law reform or abortion in Roe versus Wade in the United States. Threats to young people from devices, mobiles, and how that affects thinking and people's ideas. And I'm thinking of other countries. I'm thinking of the, uh, the country that we do mission work in, in India, where the government is strongly and militantly Hindu and seeking to make that a pure national religion and bring down every other religion so that India will be pure. And that doctrine is called Hindutva. Well, the prince of darkness, his doom is sure, Martin Luther says. We tremble not for him. And yet he seems to have the world captive. And the Holy Spirit needs to do a miracle too in your life and my life and convict the world that he is condemned. His doom is sure. Yes, we are pilgrims on a journey. But the counsellor has come to, to convince us of these truths. Every day he stands condemned. And it may not appear that way to you. And I don't think it appeared that way to the Christians who had to go to the catacombs to evade, evade detection and death and call on God's name in great trials, great hardship. Many countries all over the world burned at the stake and Jesus says, I am the King of glory. The Holy Spirit will show you that. I've gone to the Father, the risen, ascended King of glory. I read uh, last week about Korea, about parents, Christian parents. Um, husband and wife have come to faith in Jesus. And then they start a family, but they cannot tell their children what their hope is. Because if the teacher at school would ask them um, anything, and they would whisper something to say that mummy and daddy believe in Jesus, those parents would be taken away from, or the children would be taken away from the parents, or finish up in prison. We tremble not for him, the prince of darkness grim. So the third thing that Jesus says to, to his disciples is, well, consternation, yes. You're not even asking me where I'm going. Don't you want to know? And I guess it's saying to you and to me, what's your worldview? What's your worldview? What's my worldview? How does this revelation of the Holy Spirit affect your life and mine today? As you live in this sad world. The Australian Christian Lobby had a, a meeting in Launceston um, a couple of weeks ago and just 
helping us to understand something of the um, forces at work in state parliament that Tasmania is going to have the most liberal and most draconian laws about what can be taught to children. I think they're a very good organisation. They, they remind us to think critically about these things. We're not on the losing side. He is condemned. What's your worldview? How would you come to the conclusion of this truth? That the prince of this world stands condemned. How would you come to that truth? Unless God the Holy Spirit worked that miracle in your life. Well then that's what the whole of the, the Bible's about. Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and his anointed saying, let's break their chains and throw off their shackles. Brothers and sisters, young people, it's good that Jesus has gone to the Father and that he's poured out his Holy Spirit. The disciples didn't think so, but it meant that the power of the Holy Spirit would be able to be sent forth to do his miraculous work in your heart and in mine. No matter how he rages, Jesus said it's for our good that he's going to the Father. We don't need to fear. He's with us always. The prince of this world has been defeated. He's not giving up, but he has been defeated. And you can know that and I can know that because Jesus is at the Father's right hand. And that has huge ramifications for you and for me. I think I would have been afraid, but from the scripture text today, we realise why actually they didn't need to be afraid. We have a glorious future. And we can go on living confidently in this sad world. With all its hardships, with all its threats, with all the things that can cause us consternation. May I lead you in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your grace and mercy to us and that we can hear these things at this moment in time still freely. We thank you for the, the fact that we can live each day because you have sent the Holy Spirit to convict We just pray that you'll help us to understand these things every day more clearly. Spirit of God, fall on us, we pray. Go with us, help us to encourage each other in these truths and bring glory to your Father. And we pray also for one another that we won't take our eyes off the goal and the prize. And that we won't be distracted by all sorts of things that are happening in this world and philosophies that want to take over our lives. But help us to walk with you in love and gladness and boldness and determination. For the King of glory is coming back with great power. Hear our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name.